the vibes welcome back to another episode of the hoop genius podcast presented by nba 2k23 make sure you click the link in the description and get your copy of the game whilst you're there join the discord server because today bj armstrong and myself are going to continue our series of previewing the off seasons and the upcoming seasons for all 30 teams in the nba and today we have two very different teams i feel like a couple of years ago they were in a similar position but now one team is clearly ahead of the other talking of course about the cleveland cavaliers and the charlotte hornets now we've spoken a lot about the cleveland cavaliers on this podcast obviously with bj being a big fan of evan mobley and everything he's doing over there and then of course the donovan mitchell trade and then we're going to talk about the charlotte hornets who have had a very unfortunate off season for them but let's start with the Cavs. let's start with the Cavs. They lost out on Moses Brown, who went to the Clippers. Ed Davis is a free agent. Brandon Goodwin is a free agent. Laurie Markkinen was traded to the Utah Jazz along with Colin Sexton. And Rajon Rondo is also a free agent. In return for Laurie Markkinen and Colin Sexton, they received, of course, Donovan Mitchell. They signed Sharif Cooper from the Hawks. Uh, Mamadi Diak. I don't know how to pronounce that, how unfortunate, because the text is too small on the sheet for me to read. But they signed a free agent. Robin Lopez signed from the Magic. Uh, Isaiah Mobley signed as a rookie. I believe, is that the brother of Evan Mobley? Yes. The 49th pick in the draft, so the 19th pick in the second round. Raul Nato signed from the Wizards. Jamorco Pickett from the Pistons. And Ricky Rubio is back in Cleveland after tearing his ACL last mm. year starting around the league and of course they contract extended Darius Garland Dean Wade NBA 2K my team legend not Dwayne Wade Dean Wade and RJ Nambard so the Cavaliers are clearly saying look we've got a young core in Mobley Garland Allen but we're putting all our chips in the middle of the table and BJ I was playing 2K over the weekend and I played with the Cavaliers and in the process of playing with them I thought this team could really win the Eastern Conference. But then, something else struck me, is they've got great guards. They've got Garland and Mitchell, but both very small. And then they've got great bigs in Mobley and Allen, and even Kevin Love coming off the bench. I was thinking Kevin Love might be one of the most underrated players in the NBA at this point. But they've not got any good wings. They've got... Uh, you don't like Curious LeVert? You don't like Curious LeVert? I, I think he's small for a wing when you look at the KDs and Giannis's of the world. You see what I'm saying? I'm looking at matching up with Jason. T- now, I know Curious LeVert came into Boston and dropped a 50-piece or whatever he did. I like Curious mm. LeVert, but defensively, I'm looking at who's guarding Tatum, who's guarding Jimmy Butler, who's guarding Giannis, who's guarding KD. And I know you're going to tell me Evan Mobley can play the three. But they like to have those twin towers at the four and a five. Okoro, solid defensively, but offensively, he doesn't really offer anything. But do you think this team has enough to win the Eastern Conference? Because I have a sneaky feeling about them. Well, I certainly like their talent. And like every roster, you can nitpick and point what they probably can't do well. Yes, they do have small guards. However, Garland and Donovan Mitchell, that's pretty good. That's pretty solid. Mm -hmm. You know, Evan Mobley and and Jared Allen, okay, those guys are big, but the versatility that they provide for a 48-minute game is, I mean, is excellent, especially shot blocking, rim protection, finishing over the top, playing vertical basketball. This is a very formidable team. And I think they're going to cause a lot of problems. I love the big lineup. I love it when they go, you know how excited I get when I see seven footers Mm -hmm. across the line. So the lineup that I'm really looking forward to, okay, Donovan Mitchell and, and, and Garland, Darius Garland. Okay. They're small, but I like it. But when they go Kevin Love, Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, it's going to cause you some problems too on the other end. Mm-hmm. pretty solid that's pretty solid and the way you play in today's game you can play zone and so forth and so on i like what they do is it perfect no but i i like the size especially up front and what they do and and they'll be able to score the ball hopefully ricky because i thought ricky rubio was a, a was a key component to this team last year he sometimes you you know you'll get guys and get teams and you'll get 
players together and it works. Ricky Rubio, the way he plays, his leadership, he was excellent for them prior to his injury. So hopefully he'll have a speedy recovery. And he's another able body, able player. And you know what? I'm ex- I'm kind of excited. I mean, everyone, no one's talking about him. But anytime you have a player that's capable of getting a 50-point ball or scoring at that clip, he could do something. So Karis Levert, I, I think, you know, hopefully he'll be back in the fold. He's healthy now, ready to go. I like this team. And they have a lot of potential, Mo. A lot, a lot of potential. And I, I think... You know, the the staff, the executive staff, the coaches, they're really excited. I saw them over the summer. They're really excited about this year's team. How far can they go, though? What's your prediction? Like, I think they're going to be a top four seed. I think they've just got the depth compared to a lot of other guys. You know, they can afford, not that they can afford, but given that they've got so much depth, an injury to one of their key players wouldn't rock them as much as some other teams where if the star player goes down, there's a massive hole obviously left. Well, I think the best player on this team is Evan Mobley. And Better than Donovan Mitchell. Absolutely. Absolutely. Evan Mobley is the key. And Evan Mobley, as he continues to grow, and I'm not sure if next year will be that year where he'll take that leap. I think he'll make a leap. Bigs take a little longer to make that leap than guards typically in the NBA. Yeah, I mean, he, last year, I never expected him to be able to contribute the way he contributed as a small forward. Very rarely will you see a player who plays the center position in high school and college suddenly has the skill set to play the small forward position and excel and make an impact on, on, on winning. So this young man is very talented. However, I think he will probably slide into his natural position, which will probably be a power forward position. I think he can be a center as well. Mm-hmm. And let's give him a year or two to go around the league and figure it out. And I think once he has that jump and he goes into that elite category of a top 20 player or higher, I mean that's how high I, I, I think of him, I think the organization now will be an organization that said we can get to the conference finals. You don't think they could do that this year? I, I think they can. I think they can. You know, however, I don't think in their timeline, I think they're, I think, Mo, they are ahead of schedule. I don't think anyone expected or anticipated the Cleveland Cavaliers. Oh, absolutely. To be where they were last year and certainly coming into the season this year. So, I think if they could say if we can advance to the second round, I think that's a I think that's a I think that's a goal for them. However, mm-hmm. when you look at their roster, you're going, hmm, just maybe because this team has length, they have size, they can shoot, they have depth. I like them. And I wouldn't be surprised if they were able to get to the conference finals. I really wouldn't. I mean, they went three and one against the Bucks in the regular season last year. They went, let me see what they did against the Sixers. Um, but they have proven that they cause problems for a lot of teams. The Sixers beat them in all four matchups because I think Joel Embiid provides a completely different element. But that's besides the point. I think that having those two bigs there, especially on the defensive end, for a player like Giannis, who does so well attacking the paint, that teams can often struggle to overcome that because that's something different to what they usually see defensively from, from a lot of other sides. So... I think it depends on matchups. I think it really does depend on much. Like when we saw the Hawks get to the conference finals, that was matchup dependent. Same thing with the Cavaliers. But I, I think they're a real good team. I think they could finish in the top four. I think they could finish in the top four in the Eastern Conference. Oh, without question. Without question, they could finish in the top four. That, that, that's that's without question. Now, I don't, I don't think this team is putting that level, and I don't think no one's expecting them to be a top four. Mm-hmm. But that's the difference. I don't think they are expected. But, you know, the game I'm really going to circle on my calendar is the Cleveland Cavaliers versus the Minnesota Tim- uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves. Cat and Rudy versus Jerry Allen and Mobley. And Mobley. Okay. I, I, I mean, there's four seven-footers on the floor. I mean, we, yeah. we just got six more <laughs> slots. We got six more <laughs> slots. <laughs> so, you know, I mean... Well, 
I may become an Orlando Magic fan. I was oh, looking I at heard their about this lineup the with Bobo. Did you see this? This is this I, is crazy. I think I tweeted out. I think I tweeted because BJ doesn't really use social media, so he would, wouldn't even see me tweeting about him. I tweeted, they're listening to BJ Armstrong for the seven foot lineup. The Orlando Magic experimented with a front line of Paolo Manchero, Bobo, and Wendell Carter at today's practice. Uh, I mean, I like uh, that. I like, we're going to do an episode uh, about Orlando, uh, but I like it. Yes. I like it. But um, here's the last thing that we'll talk about with the Cavs before we move on to the Hornets. Um, I'm just looking at their salary sheet right now, and it looks great for this season. Uh, next season, they've got to have to, uh, they've got Isaac Cora on the team option. They're going to have to extend him. Next season, they're going to have to extend Evan Mobley as well. But in 2025, they have 96 million committed to just three players. Mm. And that's the final year of Joe Allen's contract. And that's not factoring in the likely 20, 30 million that Evan Mobley is going to get. So you're going to be sitting at 120, 130 million dollars on just four of your guys. So for now, whilst they've got guys like Rubio and Kevin Love and Karis Levert, it's going to be interesting to see moving forwards if they can maintain any of that depth, because Karis Levert right now is making 18 million dollars a year. He needs to sort out an extension. Kevin Love is in the final year of a 29 million dollar per year deal. If he goes elsewhere and gets a bigger payday, or if he takes a discount to stay with the Cavs, it's going to be interesting to see. But that's why I think they're really going to try and make a run at it this year. While they're in this unique position of Garland and Mobley still being on their rookie contracts for this year. So I think they're going to try and make a run at it. But on the other end of the spectrum, a team who has not improved this offseason, in my opinion, compared to the Cavaliers, is the Charlotte Hornets. Now, Mm. let's look at who they've lost. Montrezl Harrell went and signed with the Sixers. Arnoldus Kubolka is a free agent. Scott Lewis is a free agent. Isaiah Thomas is a free agent. And Miles Bridges, who we'll talk about in a sec, is still a free agent. They've added Leangelo Ball. Big news, teaming up with his brother. A bunch of other guys that no one is really going to discuss because I don't know if they're even going to make the roster. And they've re-signed Cody Martin. They've not really made much change from a team that was in the mid-level of the Eastern Conference last season you know, floating around that play-in spots. And then everyone else around them has improved. So they got 43 wins last year. I don't see them getting anywhere close to that this year, especially losing Miles Bridges. I don't know if they're actually going to sign him or not because his court case has got moved to sometime in October. So I believe there'll be a resolution soon. But what are the Charlotte Hornets going to do? Where do they go from here? And what is happening with them? Yeah, it, it doesn't look good right now. And I think this all stems from, you know, the Miles Bridges situation, who is, by the way, you know, without knowing the details, um, you know, please feel free to, you know, look it up. But however, it's really affected this team in their construction of their roster and how they're going to go. And what they're going to do moving he, forward. He was I mean, in line for a max contract until. All yeah, of I mean, it's happened. really affected this team, you know, with him clearly. Him sign and on the roster, it puts pressure on the organization to put a team out there that can compete and win because of his talent. However, with everything that's swirling around and, and not knowing what's going to happen. I think it's put this team kind of in limbo and are they, you know, looking to rebuild, you know, as, it, as we like to say here, retool. Mm, that's BJ likes uh, to say here. I say tank. <laughs> or are they going to continue to continue to try to win? Now, the interesting thing about this team, when you, when you look at the team as it's currently constructed, you have an all-star lead guard in LaMelo Ball. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how that fits in his timeline as far as, you know, retooling. Well, he's only or, 21. Yeah, he's only 21. But once you start losing, you never know how that affects because he's and, had. And he he's a big brand as well. He's not like a normal 21 year old. He's got a signature sneaker, private jet and all sorts. Yeah I, yeah. I don't know about all of the private jets and all of those things. 
However, on the court, he looks like a pretty good player. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how this we'll see how this turns out. We'll see how this, you know, works out. And like you said, hopefully we'll get more clarity here, you know, in the next month or two. But right now, when you look at this team and you look at their roster, you're saying, well, this is this is going to be a team that's going to really struggle this year uh, on on paper. And um, it doesn't look like they are putting together a group that can win and compete and get to the playoffs because this team was always on the fringe of getting in the playoffs. I think they were two years in a row with in the play in game uh, over the last two years. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it's tough being a team in the NBA because they're not bad enough to be as bad as certain other teams in the East. Although this year, now, without Bridges, maybe they will end up in that lottery zone. I've got to check their picks. But it's been tough in Charlotte for a number of years. They've never really been competing. You know, let's go back the last 20 years. It's been very, very tough for them. So especially with a talent like the metal ball, you're looking at it and it says, okay, are we going to now try and retool, build around him or whatever? Or is he, because you got to remember, although he's a rookie, he's got two years left on this rookie deal and then he needs an extension. And it would be a restriction, but you don't want to be in the same situation as the Phoenix Suns are in right now with DeAndre and with a rookie's contract. Went to expire, you extended it, but they didn't really want to stay. And now they're miserable and losing to... Australian teams in the preseason. We'll talk about that. Oh, at the end. stop. We'll talk it. about oh, that. At the end. We'll Let's talk about that. At the end. <laughs> yes. So they uh in terms of draft picks, in terms of draft picks, I'm just putting this up now. In the 2023 NBA draft, they have the Nuggets first round pick, the Jazz the Celtics, OKC, Washington, Dallas, and Miami's multiple second round picks. They have a lot of second round picks going into the future. And then they retain most of their own from 2024 onwards. So even being bad this season doesn't really help them. Well, you know, I don't think they anticipated or expected to be in this situation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is dependent on here in the next month or two, as far as, one of their key players. And so, you know, to give them some leeway, because no one ever expects to be in the situation that they're currently here under. I think they have to kind of figure this thing out on the fly and make adjustments as they go along, because clearly what's going on off the court is going to affect them in the direction of this franchise moving forward. What's going to happen on the court because of his impact of what he brings uh, as a player and talking about Miles Bridges. Mm. Now, so, go ahead. D- the, the only obvious way for them to improve is to develop the players that are already on their roster. They're not really going to trade sure. for anyone big. They're not really going to get a big free agent. And the advantage they do have is everyone on their roster is very young. They've only got two players mm-hmm. that are age 32, Plumley and Hayward. Then they've got Terry Rozier, who's age 28, now, he's on a, a contract for $21 million this year. He's got four more years left. He is looking like he may be on the move this year, along with Gordon Hayward, who has this season and next season on his $30 million contract. But then they've got a bunch of young guys. PJ Washington's only 24. Jalen McDaniels is 24. Nick Richards is 24. James Booknight, 22 in his sophomore season. Kai Jones is 21. JT Thor's only 20. LaMelo's only 21. So they've got young players. Maybe this season they will get the chance to develop those young players and the extra playing time and the extra touches is actually going to help them. What do you think? Well, that, that's possible. And I'm sure that's what they are potentially anticipating, or at least they're set up if they have to go in that direction. They have young talent. They have young players. You know, we will see because Gordon Hayward and these guys may be trade options to figure out what they're going to do. You know, mm-hmm. Rozier may be another guy that may be moved as we get closer to the deadline. So we'll see what they're going to do, what direction they're going in. But I think it's safe to say that they're going to try to build in the future around LaMelo. If they can secure a lottery pick here, they would definitely go for that. 
adding young talent there and then trying to, you know, retool the, the, the what they're doing or what they're missing. So they're they're kind of in limbo right now of what they're going to do. However, they do have nice young players, nice young talent, like you said. But every team has nice young players and nice young talent, and you're going to need to build up upon that and you're going to need exceptional players. And I think they have a good starting point right now with LaMelo at the guard position. And now they just have to build from there. So I mentioned it earlier and we're going to talk about it now. The Phoenix Suns lost their preseason opener. Is that a big deal, Mo? Is that a big it's deal? It's a huge deal. Okay, why? Because they lost against the Adelaide 36ers. Okay. An Australian team who won only 10 games in the entirety of last season. That's the last season. What about this season? How many of those guys that played last night played on it's last pre-se- season? It's preseason. It's preseason. So I don't know how their season has gone this season. <laughs> no. This, this how many of those game. guys who played on the team this year, this game, played on the team a last fair year? A fair few. Most of them. Well, how many? I don't, yeah, because I don't, most, of the, most of the foreign players, are the they, those are the key players. Let me get that. Let me get that roster. Yeah, yeah. Let's get let it. Get so that their, way, let me get that roster. Let, up, let, okay. Let's, let, let's make sure we state the facts here, and then let's yes, get the facts. Yes, yes. Because because I watched that game last night. By the way. Okay. And, and what were your thoughts while you were watching it? Those guys. Those guys were shooting at a clip that I've never seen before. They were shooting. <laughs> they lights. they listened to yesterday's episode <laughs> of the podcast. That's no, why. No, seriously. <laughs> they were shooting lights out. I mean, actually, I mean, well, you know me. And I think our listeners know me. I'm not really into the, you know, the preseason. I watch the regular season, but the preseason. But they were shooting so well last night. You can ask my wife. My wife actually started watching mm-hmm. because they were, it was so fun to watch them play because they were shooting. They were playing like, it was like playground basketball. One pass up and they were, everything they were doing were going in. They, everything they were throwing up was going in. Now, Here's the thing that was made me really I, I was cheering for them last night because of the following. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just one guy. I think the kid's name was Randall. It just wasn't one guy. It was like three or four of them that was all hot yep. at the he, same Randall time. Randall was 13 of 21, including nine of 17 from outside. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was like unbelievable. It was so it was so bad for the Phoenix Suns. They couldn't even defend because the guys were shooting literally from half court. They would just shoot. They were just throwing up stuff, and it was going in last night. And every one of those guys was on fire for a full forty-eight minutes. It was it was so exciting. And listening to the commentators last night was great. They was like, "Have you ever seen anything like this?" And, and you were watching, going, "Now, do I think that they play like this all the time?" No, Randall, get this guy an NBA contract. I don't know where he's from or. He was shooting the ball so good last night. I don't even think he touched the net as it was going through. He was yep. just on fire. He, he was, and, but they had like three or four guys that was on fire. I mean, their whole team was on okay, fire. Okay, but but here's the deal. Phoenix Suns played like they did in game seven against Dallas. It's not that... Uh, where was the I'm defense? Saying, when, you're bringing the, <laughs> when you're taking the ball out of the net, I don't care who you are. This team plays like this. They win 50 games in the NBA. Now, do I think they can play like this every game? It was crazy to watch. I mean, it really was because they were shooting the ball at such a high clip. Now, what it shows you is the impact that three-point shooting has. That's what it shows you. Mm-hmm. It's a different game. So we could sit here and when you're shooting the ball, here's the thing to look out for, Mo. Whoever wins the three-point shooting contest in the NBA games, more times than not, wins the, the regular season game. More than the times and not wins the yeah playoffs. scoring more three pointers than the other team tends yes. to mean you have more points. Yeah, yeah. But you know <laughs> that was pretty funny. No, <laughs> no, no, that's not what I mean. When you make twenty and the other team only makes ten, okay, and when you're like a plus five, you're going to. That was pretty funny though. That was funny. That t- that that puts more pressure on you to shoot at a higher clip. You just explain if you're Matt. getting the same amount of shot. <laughs> so if he's no, got twenty no, and he's got no, ten, it's, of not, that, it's, it's, <laughs> of it's not that simple. Anyway, you know, the, what, the reason why is well, what, what the thing you got to say is your percentage of threes does matter in today's game. Yes. let's just say that if you if you're, if you're getting eighty shots, 
you ought to make sure that you're getting your fair share of threes. The reason why it's a big deal is this was the first ever preseason loss against a non-NBA team since. Do you know the last time an NBA team lost against a non-NBA team? It wasn't that long ago. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Who, who knows? I mean, who, who knows? Who cares? It's preseason. It's, it's interesting. Okay. Let's, In 2016, let's the Oklahoma City Thunder lost to a 16-year-old Luka Doncic in Real Madrid, which I think was pretty cool because I was there in the arena. And um, before that, I don't think its NBA team has lost at home to a non-NBA team since 2004, 2005. But it's preseason, but it's also still funny that the uh, Phoenix Suns got destroyed in their last game of last season and the first game of this season, they picked up right where they've left off. Is this a sign of things to come? Because I it's not like they just played it, their well, I, I'm gonna, Listen, I'm, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to make too big of a deal, but I will say this. I think the, the Phoenix Suns, in just watching the game, I the score and all the things really didn't matter. It was fun to watch of the following. It's obvious to me they're going to miss the defensive presence of Jay Crowder. It's obvious to me that they are very small as a team now, with the exception of DeAndre Ayton in their starting lineup. It's obvious to me that they're going to miss all of that, the blue collar and all of the, the things that you need to be a good team, which is, you know, who's going to set screens, who's going to get the loose balls, who's going to anchor your defense. Jay Crowder provided a lot of things that probably didn't translate on the, you know, in the, in the stat sheet, but the things he was able to do. And, and the, one of the big things is the toughness that he brought to the game, to the team. So the starting lineup of Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson, Deion, uh, Aiden Devin Booker, Booker yeah. Chris Paul, and Aiden, that's, that to me is the team that, probably won't win 45 or 50 games. However, you know, anytime you have Devin Booker and Chris Paul and DeAndre Ayton, you know what, and Mikhail Bridges, to me, that works. Now, they're going to have to figure out who can fill that role and fill that void and provide size, first of all, toughness, and rebounding, because the only rebounder they have on the floor is DeAndre Ayton. So I think they're going to have to put some toughness in that lineup, put someone here that can do some of the dirty work and give them some size because they had no size. It was obvious to me watching the game last night. But other than that, I don't think they're that far away, but they lost a very good player in Jay Crowder. Jay Crowder is a very, very good player. Um, you know, he may not be a 20 point score, but what he does and what he provides to a team very valued, especially when we're talking about good teams. Uh, I think he must have been somewhere smiling after watching Cam Johnson replace him in a starting lineup and then score four points on 29% shooting against guys in the Australian League, which is one of the worst teams in the Australian League. Interesting. We'll see how the Phoenix Suns progress this season because Chris Paul, you mentioned, is another year older. DeAndre Ayton, clearly unhappy. Um, we're going to have to see how things go. And I know they were really going hard after Kevin Durant in the offseason. That didn't work out. But we'll see if there's any more drama for Kevin Durant and potentially him being a savior for this team. Anyway, that's another episode of the Hoop Genius Podcast. We'll be back tomorrow with another one. So make sure you stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe, leave a review, leave a rating. And unlike the Phoenix Suns last night, make sure you get buckets.